join us today for Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz in our after show Buzz Reaction. I'm Ruth Nelson, joined by Hall of Famers Mick Haley, Bob Bertucci, and Brian Gimilero, bringing you the most current issues and trends in volleyball. Our weekly news show has leaders in our sport provide their perspective on the questions that are asked, along with the discussion on topics that are current and ones that are affecting all of us. A newsflash, Toyota pulls Olympic TV ads in Japan. Tokyo is under its fourth state of emergency, and there's a, been a rise in the Delta variant COVID-19 cases. At least 70 plus people in the Olympic Village have already tested positive for the virus. The Japanese Olympic Committee declared on July 8th that no fans, foreign or domestic, will be allowed to attend. Total costs for the Tokyo Olympics are estimated to reach 25 billion, with Japan losing out roughly 830 million just for its decision to ban spectators. It could cost reinsurers up to 400 million in payouts for tickets, hospitality re refunds, according to Fitch rating. Knightcommission.org states college sports needs new leadership that puts athletes first. Take a listen to their current recommendations for a change on transforming the NCAA D1 model. Front Office Sports has released Athlete Marketing Essentials, a six lesson course designed to help collegiate athletes and those who work with them to better understand the tools and resources available to make the most of their ability to profit off name, image, and likeness. I just finished my course and it was worth the time to stay on top of the current trends since NIL has opened the doors for athletes to make money from a wide variety of business ventures without losing their eligibility. As we know, the biggest dilemma, what is the athlete's fair market value? Want to make a difference? Please remember to renew your AVCA membership, the one organization that represents all coaches at all levels when lobbying to the changes that are needed in our sport. And you can make a difference by registering avca.org. Boy, today we have the professor as our very special guest who has won a gold medal in the 2008 Beijing Olympics, is coaching at the D1 level in training beach players and coaches around the country. So let's head over to, is it Austin, Texas? Are we back yet, Mick? with former Olympic coach Mick Haley, who will introduce our guest today. Mick. Thank you, Ruth. And I am back from Europe. And uh, I don't know if I'm over jet lag or not, but it's my special privilege to introduce Todd Rogers to you today. Todd is a seven-year head coach at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, the beach program out there. And of course, as you said, the legendary gold medal winner in Beijing in 2008. Uh, actually, he's played in two Olympics. Uh, Todd, uh, really great to have you on today. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks, Mick, and thanks to all of you for having me on uh, Master Coaches. Real treat to be on here with uh, a bunch of luminaries in the sport. Yeah, I don't know about the luminaries, but uh, <laughs> we, we certainly will light up from time to time. I didn't know if we were going to get you on today. Ruth had so much news uh, that I was a little worried that I wasn't going to get to ask a question. But uh, now that we're now that we've got uh, what's going on in the world, uh, I do have some interesting, uh, I think, uh, questions, at least from my standpoint, that I'd like to, to ask you about. Um, you know, you finished your playing career about five years ago. And incidentally, you still have that uh, wonderful court in your backyard. We actually sold that house uh, about a dozen years ago. Um, oh. No, no longer. Yeah, so did the court raise the value of the house? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think so to the, the, the folks that ended up buying, literally knocked on the door and said, hey, we saw you listed your house on Zillow, make me move. Uh, and we went, <laughs> okay, you want it for the price offered? Yes. Okay, done. <laughs> good good job of sales that's it that's great well that was state of the art at one time and uh i actually had called you and gotten information on how you build it because we were trying to figure out how we were going to put in courts at usc and some other places and you were quite helpful so thank you for that but uh so uh, let, let's get right into this so can you give me a perspective for what it's like normally as a player in the olympics uh, because you've played in two and you've had those crowds and you, you know all the difficulties and the, the things that work well. And then uh, tell me what you feel will be different for the players in this Olympics with, with no attendance and that sort of thing. Can you compare and contrast both of those for us? 
I think it's going to be very difficult for the athletes uh, at the Olympics for, for the vast majority of them, especially in beach volleyball, where it's a kind of a riotous sport. Uh, it's loud. People are cheering during play. You know, there's no golf clap there. It's about singing and screaming and chanting uh, and really getting behind the, the guys that you're rooting for, the country that you're from. So I do think that will be a difficulty, at least on the beach volleyball side. Uh, from my own perspective, I, I can't imagine not having fans. I mean, a part of the whole, the whole point of sports to me a lot of times is to have fans that have family out there, have friends out there. Uh, cheering and waving flags, especially at the Olympics where you're representing your country. Uh, I, I do think it'd be tough to, to not have it. It wouldn't be so difficult in terms of representing your country because that's just a, a flat out honor. Uh, so I don't think getting up for the actual matches themselves will be difficult. Um, but I do think there's an aspect that will be missing for them. And I kind of feel for them. Have, have you talked to any of them how they might fill that void or what they do? Do they do self-talk? Do they, I mean, you know, you really have to figure out something. Um, and I don't think, I think the tournaments that they played in that they qualified in, I think those had spectators, didn't they this year and last year? They did all the, all pretty much, I think all, but maybe some AVP events had spectators. So, so most of them are used to that. Uh, I do know a lot of them do a lot of meditation type stuff beforehand just as a precursor to all of their matches i think a lot of athletes are going down that that road uh, and it seems to work for a lot of them and then i'm sure a lot of them have the old well you know that that guy he looked at my girl wrong one day or you know whatever it is to get the chip on the shoulder to make it work for them i'm sure everyone's got some kind of story that they can go back to 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 fire up to get after those guys or those gals Maybe we call that the old uh, Tim Hovland or Steve Obradovich uh, mentality yeah. on the beach, right? For sure. Those two were <laughs> two of the best on that front. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the COVID issue. So how, how does that impair um, the team uh, testing and all of that? Is that another problem or is it because you're outdoors and that sort of thing? Is that not too much of a problem? I mean, the testing and all the things around it are, uh, I would say, a minor nuisance. Uh, it's something that I feel like a lot of us have just kind of just gotten used to, uh, whether it's college sports and you're getting tested you know, two or three times a week at times, uh, or pro sports where you're consistently being tested on a, at least a weekly basis, if not even a daily basis, when you're actually in competition, which I believe is what's going on in Tokyo, is they're literally getting tested on a daily basis. Uh, so I, I don't think that's going to be a huge concern. It's pretty, pretty easy nowadays. Uh, I mean, as far as people getting affected, I've already seen a handful of athletes uh, in the beach volleyball community that have uh, either are in quarantine or have been affected. I know I, I just read recently that a, a Czech male player has tested positive for it and I don't know that he's going to be able to even play. And I've seen multiple athletes throughout the Olympics uh, getting tested positive it's a little bit scary because you know at least in the beach volleyball and i'm sure in other sports as well and even indoor volleyball you've got them together you have to have them together and if one of them tests positive all of a sudden there's the quarantine factor how long are they doing that for and i'm not super up to speed on that uh, but it's almost like you want to keep everyone away for as long as you can uh, with each other even though they want to communicate and have that camaraderie and hey we're team usa that you kind of want to have them flying on different flights, different rooms, don't hang out during dinner, can't talk to one another. It's kind of just, I mean, really, it, 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 there's a lot of it that's a little bit sad because that's part of, you guys all know, it's part of being at the Olympics is that camaraderie and, and we're representing something that's bigger than, than we are. Well, you may not have heard, but it was reported this morning that uh, Taylor Crabb is out. Uh, he has tested positive and... Uh, we've heard that he's being replaced and they're flying an athlete in. Do you know anything about this at all? Uh, I had heard the same thing um, that, uh, that Taylor had tested positive uh, and I had heard that uh, Triborn was, was flying out there. I don't know all the details other than that, like literally just what I read in the news. Um, so I, I, I feel horrible for, for Taylor, uh, the one bat, the one good side for him, or I guess silver lining, is that he's going to have a lot of opportunities. He's an incredibly talented player. 
uh, and he's younger, obviously at 20, I don't know what he is exactly, 27, 28. Uh, who I really feel for is Jake Gibb. Four Olympics now. Uh, he's 44. I'm pretty sure he ain't coming back for another one, although he defied the odds for sure at 44. Uh, I mean, he's just had a stellar career, and I know he would have, you know, that opportunity to get that, that medal, whatever color that would be, uh, he's been in the mix every single time. So, and he's a good man. And so I kind of feel for him, not to say that he and Tri couldn't shock the world, um, but I do think it'd be a little bit of a shock the world kind of, uh, kind of thing because they have not played together at all. So maybe you don't want to comment about this, but here's what goes through my mind. I, I worked, how long does it take to qualify? Does it take the whole quadrennial to qualify? Uh, two years. Two years of the four-year quadrennial quadrennial to qualify and I and I qualify and I get a chance to go to the Olympics why wouldn't I get vaccinated I mean as an athlete I just can't uh, fathom that anybody whether it's uh, NBA like you know the Lakers lost some players at the end of the season because uh, they contracted the the virus and uh, weren't vaccinated uh, I just can't comprehend in my own mind why I wouldn't get vaccinated. Is there a mentality with, with elite athletes uh, uh, about being afraid of the virus or uh, afraid of the uh, uh, vaccinations or uh, what might it be? Well, I don't think it's uh, being afraid of the virus. Otherwise, I think they would get vaccinated. Uh, there may be some fear about the actual vaccination itself, for sure, uh, particularly from the perspective of is it going to somehow affect their performance or, uh, you know, not everyone has, has been perfectly fine after getting vaccinated. Uh, so I could see that actually being a little bit of a fear. I actually was, I don't know if Taylor was vaccinated or unvaccinated. I don't know what I the report said. Um, I mean, you can still get the virus, obviously. I think it's just less likely. So that's about it. as far as I can go on that. And I can't, without getting into the mind of, of Taylor to see if he was vaccinated, unvaccinated, um, tough to know. Yeah. Hey, yeah. say, Bob, Bob's got to go. He's got some questions, Mick. Oh, I, I know. He's, he's all scared. those questions yeah, you got. Go, Bobby. Well, I, you know, Todd, you know, two years to qualify, that that's pretty tough. I mean, that's a, a pretty big commitment. So I, I feel for, for Taylor. Uh, but why don't you talk to us a little bit about what it takes to, you know, in terms of your priority, uh, in, in terms of your training, you know, and, and what, what takes priority as you get closer to the Olympics for, for some of our younger athletes listening? Well, because it is a two-year process, uh, it is pretty lengthy, and there's quite a few tournaments that you can play in. Uh, when I qualified both in 08 and 12, our goal was actually to qualify essentially the year before. So when the qualification process started in January 1 of 2007 was to hopefully get enough tournaments and enough points in 2007 where we could really make 2008 our own. We could craft it to the exact specifications that we wanted in order to be able to train, be physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, whatever ready uh, to be able to compete and really peak uh, at the Olympics. Uh, so there's different theories of thought on that. That was ours. We kind of, in some ways, copied Misty and Carrie a lot because that's how they always tried to qualify. Uh, and obviously they had tremendous success. And so then we ultimately had success uh, then as well. So uh, it's a tough one because it's a long, long process. Uh, and if you're, if a perfect example actually is Clay and Sponsel who were on the, on the bubble, on the bad side of the bubble, and literally had to get a top two or three finish in order to be able to qualify. And fortunately for them, they stepped up in a big way and won two in a row actually to, to beat out Carrie actually and her partner, Brooke. Uh, but that's like when you're training that hard, you're almost having to peak a month and a half, two months before the Olympics just to make the Olympics. Is that detrimental? I mean, it could be, I think it is, uh, but hopefully I'm wrong. And they go out there and they're peaking and they're able to keep that peak for, for two months and kick some butt in the Olympics. Yeah, it's tough to keep a peak for two months, but hopefully they'll be successful at doing that. Yeah. You know, talking about, you, you know, your partner in 2008 and, and how Phil is doing right now and still battling for, for a gold. 
nobody knows Phil better than you. Give us a little insight on, on Phil. Uh, Phil is uh, an inwardly very competitive guy. He's not a very outward, demonstrative uh, kind of athlete. Uh, I mean, obviously in big moments, he can be, as all of us usually are, very demonstrative. Uh, he's a very cerebral athlete. Uh, and it always kind of, it always cracks me up because he doesn't necessarily come across that way. But he is a real thinker of the game. He's a real thinker of what's going to be successful in, in life. Uh, I really enjoy, even to this day, I uh, ha had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago just to, to chat with him about, he and Nick both, just to chat with him, hey, how are you guys feeling? Where's your mindset, et cetera? And they were feeling fantastic. I, I really enjoy those conversations with him because he's smart, he's sharp, uh, he stays up on everything, whether that's volleyball or politics or finances, whatever that is. So it's uh, he's not very like open and, and uh, gregarious. Uh, so if you just first meet him, he's going to be a very, very quiet guy. Uh, but as far as talent's concerned, man, I, I, he's up there as far as one of the top athletes to ever play our game, in my opinion, both indoor and certainly beach. Well, and how about Nick? Now, you mentioned Nick, and obviously there's some similarities between you and Nick. And, you know, let's talk about that and how that, that partnership as he's taken your spot, uh, you know, what are the similarities and what are the differences? Uh, I mean, Nick's a better athlete than I am. Uh, he, I mean, he's extraordinarily dynamic. We used to do track workouts and we'd call him the Greyhound because he just would lope around me. And he's, I mean, he's a little, probably an inch smaller than me, but man, his stride was enormous and it just looked like he wasn't even trying yet. He would just smoke all of us. <laughs> so he's, he's really a tremendous athlete. Uh, much better than myself, uh, where he has struggled over the years, but has overcome, in my opinion, and has really made this uh, a strength for the most part, is uh, his cerebral game and the way he he competes and controls himself. He used to have a lot of the peaks and valleys, uh, and now he's much more level and allows those those peaks to get there, but never allows those valleys to drop below his consistency factor. Uh, so in talking to both of them, they said they felt great, uh, which is always a concern when you're 41 years old, which both of them are. Uh, so I, I'm stoked for Nick. He's, I, I hope again, I hope they both get, I hope Phil gets another gold and Nick is first uh, because they're good men, they're family men, uh, they love their wives and they got great kids too. So I have a lot of respect for them and, and hope that they kick some booty. Well, I, I hope so too. I, I had the opportunity to meet both Phil and Nick when we were down in Florida with the yeah. Beach Nation Clinic. And, and they really are fine guys and, and it'll be neat to follow them going the Olympics. I'm gonna kick it over to Brian. I know he has a couple of questions for you, more Olympic type questions. So Brian? Hi Todd, how are you? Good Brian, how you doing? Great, thanks. It's nice to see you. I wanted to talk more about the actual this games. What, what do you know? <clears throat> what are our chances? Who's out there? Who's the team to beat? What nation is the strongest? And <clears throat> not just men, but the men and women. <clears throat> asking, excuse me, asking you to be an expert on both ends of it. Uh, what do you? What? Uh, what's your prediction? Uh, well, I'll start with the women. Uh, just, I really think our our women are both medal contenders. Uh, I think that Alex and, and April have proven that over the last couple of years, and obviously April has proven that over a decade uh, or even more actually. Um, so I really like our chances to, to get a medal and even have, a, I think we have a really, really good shot if both of those teams are playing at their best to be able to get two medals. Um, kind of like a repeat of when uh, Carrie and Misty defeated Jen and April in London in the finals. I mean, I think that would be fantastic. I think their main competitors are gonna be as always Brazil. Um, Agatha and Duda are really, really strong. Duda's arguably, arguably, you know, the best player in the world, uh, one of for sure. Uh, then of course the Canadian top Canadian team, uh, and their second team is solid as well. Can have a good, a good, uh, tournament. And then some maybe slightly a little bit less, uh, outliers, but very, very athletic, uh, the Australian team and the Swiss team who have all been in the mix and have won tournaments before. So on the women's side, that's kind of how I see it. I would, I would think everyone else might be a little bit more of a, of a dark horse than a, a favorite. Uh, on the men's side, the Norwegian team, Molen Sorum, uh, they really have been the best team in the world the last 
two, three years. Uh, but their last couple of tournaments, they've struggled a little bit. Uh, and a, a little bit of uh, insight, actually, was uh, given to me by Phil when I had dinner. He and Nick Phil told me that Sorum used to get the, get the guy that got served every time, and he's the defender. And now guys were serving mole the last three tournaments, and he was the blocker, and he was really struggling to side out. Uh, and the chemistry, actually, on the team itself changed. Uh, for, from a coaching perspective, that was really interesting how you know, one guy got served, and they were – wildly successful and then the other guy started getting served and you see that a lot sometimes in beach where one guy's so accustomed to having all that weight on him that he's, he's just good with it and the partner supports him well and then all of a sudden that switches and they go to the other guy and one partner doesn't know how to support the other one when he starts struggling but I think they're still physically a, a, a really dominant team and, and will be up there on the podium in all likelihood uh, the Russian, they're the world championships, or they won the world championships. Krasilnikov and uh, his partner, Stoyanovsky, I think it is. Yeah. Something like that. Probably just killed that. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, pretty, they're a pretty amazing team as well. Of course, you've got the two Brazilian teams. They're always in the mix. Uh, and then another team that's kind of a random team, uh, but they're really, really good, is Qatar. Or Qatar. Uh, they've really proven over the last, I'd say, year and a half, two years, uh, that they're one of the, the forces to be reckoned with. They're very, very athletic, and they've been in the mix a ton over, I think, pretty much every major tournament this year. So really, they're kind of a fun team to watch, too. Uh, really, really dynamic and enjoyable. And, of course, our, our guys uh, hopefully will, will be in that mix. I don't think they'll be considered one of the favorites. But then again, they're athletically, if Phil and Nick can play to their, their top shape, I think they're, they can match up with anyone else in the world. Wow, well, exciting. I had no idea of some of those teams. I mean, that's, that's great. I can't wait to watch. I hope everyone stays healthy. I'm going to, it's, it's, by the way, it's great to see you coach in the collegiate level now. I think it's great that you give back and I wish the best. I actually have a player who uh, wants to talk to you. So we'll get together. I think she's pretty good. So uh, okay. we got to talk about that. Sounds good. <laughs> Just some here. Anyway, I'm kicking it over to Ruth. Wow, you guys are being so nice to me. I told you, Todd, they very rarely give me this amount of time to ask questions. So I get to ask you the fun questions is, what in the world possessed you to want to retire? Uh, this thing called lots of white hairs and age. Um, that was probably the number one factor there. Uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I, I was pretty much injury free for the vast majority of my career. I had a few small things, but never had to have surgery. I actually did tear my labrum trying to, when we were trying to go to Greece uh, in my shoulder, uh, but I was able to just rehab it and had never had surgery on it. I uh, didn't have an, any knee problems at all until I was 30, gosh, 38, 39, something like that. Um, but around 40, it just started getting a little bit more difficult. Uh, and I remember talking to Karch about it uh, and he just said the recovery the amount of time for the recovery was the one that really got him. And I started feeling that as well. I used to have a really difficult track workout that we would do and I could, I would be fine the next day, go train. And after my track workout, I, I realized the next day, every time I went and train, I felt like I was about to hurt myself. Uh, and so then it took me two days. And then literally on the third day, I finally was feeling good. And I realized I, I can't do this anymore. Like physically, I'm really, really struggling. And there's the mental component as well that, in the last couple of years, uh, I was struggling to be a good partner um, to guys that were younger that I was trying to teach and you know, bring them up. They were bigs like Phil, uh, very talented guys. And I was just, I was not doing as good of a job by them. And I started seeing that in myself and I didn't like that. Um, so I realized, you know what, it's, it's time to walk away. The body's telling me that it's time to walk away uh, and my demeanor and the way that I'm coming across to these young men that are good guys and they're all still my you know good friends of mine yep but i wasn't treating them the way that i should have been okay so why coaching your what's your what's your degree in <laughs> okay uh, religious studies okay so religion took you to coaching yeah i actually i uh, i stayed a fifth year because i registered my freshman year at ucsb and uh, okay. i actually could have graduated in three uh but i 
I didn't want to, I enjoyed it. I had a great team. And so I went and I asked my counselor, what can I do? And he's like, Hey, why don't you get a, you love to coach. Cause I was already in coaching. I was actually coaching multiple club teams for indoors. Mm-hmm. So I did get a coaching minor while I was at UCSB. Uh, and, uh, I literally have been involved in coaching since I graduated high school in some way, shape or form. When I finished at UCSB, I took over the Santa Barbara boys volleyball club. Uh, I built them from, you know, three teams to eight before I kind of started focusing more on the beach side of things. Coached at UC Santa Barbara for Kenny Preston from 99 to 2005. And uh, obviously I played for him at UCSB as well. Uh, And then even when I started playing with Phil and I asked, the, the AD, Gary Cunningham, who used to coach with John Wooden and some other guys, uh, hey, am I screwing myself here for coaching? And they said, no, you've already put your, you put your time in. You've got a good resume and you're, you're still young enough at 32 that if, if you don't go, co- or if go play now, you won't be able to play much longer because your, your age will get catch you. And as we talked about previously, it certainly did. So focused on playing and I got my coaching chops through my children coaching them in soccer, basketball, volleyball, beach volleyball, everything I could. So I kind of, I kept the coaching bug going there. I always knew I wanted to coach. I've always- And women though, you're you're coaching women now at Cal Poly. Women now, yes. Um, And got my first taste of that with my daughter uh, throughout the tenure of playing and whatnot. Um, It is different. It's just, you know, it's different. There's there's positives and negatives, I think, on both sides of the male, female coin. but I enjoy both of them. Uh, so I've really enjoyed my time at Cal Poly. Uh, it's been fantastic. And, and hopefully we can continue what we've been, been doing there for quite some time. All right, Mick, you did such a great introduction. We are so happy, Todd, that you've been on, uh, but we've run out of time. This is one thing that we always say, we, we can't do an hour show, but we, we would love, we know all guys, we'd love to have him back again to talk more about coaching and women. So thanks, Todd, for coming on. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks all you guys. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, you, Todd. Yeah, Appreciate you, it very much. you missed one of our shows or our remix flashbacks, jump over to Instagram and click on our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook at Volleyball Master Coaches, Instagram and Twitter, VD Master Coaches. A special shout out to our partners, SNA Sports and Baden Sports. And thanks to our content providers, NFHS, JBA, Coaches Insider and AVCA. And a special thank you to the now 82 coaches and leaders in our sport for being a guest on our show over the past 61 weeks. See on Facebook Live after John closes our show today and join our Master Coaches Buzz Reaction to not only hear Master Coaches continue their conversation on today's show, but also to hear from Mick how he spent his four weeks in Slovenia and Croatia. Now, let's go to our Buzz in our Buzz Reaction digital partner, Dr. John Foreman, who will update us on his most recent podcast. Thanks, Ruth. I actually have a podcast to report on now. It's <laughs> going to come out on Sunday. I had a conversation with uh, Oskar Kaczmarczyk, uh, Polish, now former coach from the Swiss League, uh, previously spent a lot of time in the Polish League and in the Polish national team as a scout but he's recently taken on the role of what we might consider a general manager type position with one of the Polish clubs. And I, uh, he and I talked with also Mark Lebedew on the prospects for that sort of thing, because traditionally in professional volleyball, they tend to operate on a single year cycle because of budgets and, and contracts are short and all that. Whereas Oscar's role is to try to take a bigger picture, longer term point of view. So that, I look forward to letting people hear that on, on Sunday and hearing what they have to say. So with that, let's head on to uh, Buzz Reaction. All righty. Welcome to our Buzz Reaction and today's Master Coaches are continuing their discussion on the upcoming Olympic Games beginning Friday, July 23rd, as well as discussing our upcoming guest for July 28th. And rounding out the hour, Mick will be sharing some of his thoughts and experiences on his recent training in Slovenia and coaching one of the BIT teams to the top, well, not quite the top, we'll say top three, finish in the 2021 Global Challenge. 
So master coaches, let's take a look at the conversation we just had with Todd and talk a little bit about the Olympics. Well, I, I just had one thing. I, Todd's been one of our best guests. Uh, what an articulate uh, guy. And he certainly answered the question straight on. May have thrown him a little curve there on the, the COVID testing thing. But uh, uh, that that's the thing that comes across to me. I was watching all of the NBA sports and the Major League Baseball. And I just couldn't fathom if I were in those guys' situation uh, couldn't fathom not getting a vaccination. And of course, I grew up in the area of polio, uh, the time that polio was a big deal, and we couldn't get a vaccination. And I had friends that uh, were scarred for life uh, uh, from that, uh, that uh, disease. And uh, a vaccination was a saving grace for all of us. So we, at my age, we, we absolutely look to the vaccinations to keep our country safe. But there seems to be a whole different attitude out there amongst uh, uh, a lot of people about these vaccinations. So I, I was interested to ask Todd how, how he and the athletes that he's worked with and been around to feel about that. And, and, and I'd just like to understand because uh, I just wouldn't put myself or my team in that situation. Well, let me, I, I want to react to that too, Mick. I, I know it wasn't a, really a question for Todd, and it was nice of him to, to give his opinion, uh, uh, give us a, his insight. Uh, uh, I agree with you uh, in many, for many reasons. You know, you, you mentioned polio, uh, smallpox. Uh, when we were kids, everybody got a shot. You weren't asked, and it still happens. And smallpox has been eradicated from, from almost everywhere in the world. And um, polio has been eradicated. And the reason for those things was because of vaccines. Vaccine eradicated those diseases. Um, uh, in California right now, 100% uh, in the last month, or not last two weeks, I don't wanna be wrong, last two weeks, 100% of the uh, hospitalizations have been from uh, unvaccinated people. So you're, the people who are getting sick are unvaccinated. And they they're spreading it, and the and this illness will never go away. This and it's almost all from the variant, so it is going to continue on indefinitely. When people say they want to resume their lives, I want to resume my life free by everybody getting vaccinated. Period. And as far as an athlete goes, um, uh, it, they've got to think of more about than themselves. Right now, you, you know, a beach party, you got one partner and now you're not being able to play <laughs> and that's letting that other person down. You're hurting other athletes. You're hurt, and if a team is a big team, you're really hurting them. Uh, and it's a real, in my mind, a real greedy position, especially as a coach or a teammate. And just as a citizen, it's upsetting to me that I have now in California, everybody's wearing masks again and for good reason. And, uh, and it's, it's, if everybody got a vaccine, vaccination, we would be, it just could be gone and we return to our normal lives. That's it. Okay, so let me just do a review for our uh, viewers. The Women's Beach, there are 24 teams, there are 17 countries, and seven of those countries have two teams, including USA. So it's Brazil, Canada, he talked about them, China, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Then on the men's side, You've got 24 teams, 19 countries. Thank you, John, for the added extra country. Five countries have two teams, including USA, which is Brazil, Italy, Poland, and ROC. And I told Mick and John prior to the show, I had to look up what ROC was. I thought it was first Republic of China. Then I looked it up and it's Russian Olympic Committee. And what they've done is they're not allowing them to designate them as Russians when they win their medal. And when they win their medal, they're not playing the Russian anthem. They're doing Tchaikovsky's piano concert number one instead. Well, it's and a great song. Yeah, it's a great composition. It's a yeah, good one. That's <laughs> music, hey, it's a, a no bayer. Okay, so and, that kind and, of- Ruth, the, Well, the reason for that is? Is because cheated. of the doping the blood uh -huh. doping, they've been put on suspension. Then they gave them because of COVID, to be honest with you, had COVID not occurred, they wouldn't have been able to participate at all. 
period. But now they're under ROC. Interesting. All right, that's my. And that's that's just like the NC two A when the, you get caught with a penalty, you come back as another name. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now that. Or you take colleges. You do the Kalapari thing. You you, you go <laughs> to another college, right? <laughs> oh, that's unbelievable. But Todd was. I mean, what a great. When you really think about how humble he is, and how great he was, and to talk how wonderful you know, that all the teams are doing and paying attention to the, of course, the women's because he coaches, but he's still actively involved in watching the men. But what a great overview. I think he's going to be a really, he is, he is not only going to be, he's a very good coach and, you know, coaching on the beach myself, the, the uh, personality, his personality is perfect for the beach game. He'll great ambassador. Really well. Great ambassador for the sport without yeah, question. No question. Well, he really is. And Ruth kind of hit the nail on the head, uh, you know, Todd is, uh, you know, very humble guy, uh, really wants to help people. I mean, he's a perfect personality for a coach. I mean, I've, I've worked a number of clinics with him now, and he treats the worst kid on the, on the court the same as he treats the best kid, and, it's all, and he treats them all good. And, and he's more than happy to spend time with people, never thinks of himself, you know, as any better than anybody else that's out there on – on the sand with him. He, he's, he's really a great guy. Hey, Bob, I also thought it was pretty interesting uh, when he talked about, you know, I asked the question about the similarities and differences between him, you know, being a partner with Nick and, and uh, a partner with Phil and, and Nick. And, you know, he didn't talk anything again. He didn't talk about himself, who is a very consistent, you know, you know, always, always on the mark kind of guy uh, and talked about the improvement that Nick has made in terms of being able to be much more consistent. And, I, and all of us know, you know, Todd was a very consistent player all his career. My question to you, Bob, could you give us a, just a couple minutes on what's Beach Nation? You know, what is it? Well, Beach Nation is, is a, a group of people that got together. Uh, you know, other than myself, it's all people that are involved in beach volleyball. Uh, basically trying to, to, to do what's being done in the indoor game on, on the beach, just education of coaches and players uh, to raise the level of, of beach volleyball and expose the sport across the country. Okay, excellent. If you guys have a couple other things, because I'd like to actually put up uh, the indoor side, because we haven't really touched that, but if you guys have a couple other things you want to add to that. I, I was shocked when he says guitar. Guitar's got a great team. I did. I haven't followed. I didn't know. I thought that, that would be interesting. This, you know. I think because their athletic ability is is phenomenal, and they've they've been very competitive. Yeah, I was, I was shocked. What, uh, Bob? Do you know what happened to the Latvian men's team that was so good for a while? No, I honestly I can't say I, I do know. They were the number one team in the world, and I, I didn't. They're gone. I don't know. I heard one of them got hurt, but I didn't know. Anyway. Okay, so I put up women's and men's uh, teams. Uh, someone want to talk a little bit about each of them? How good is China? Does anyone know? China women or China men? Yeah. Women. Well, the, good. This, is, this is a hard one to talk about because, and John, you may know more than I do about this, but... Uh, uh, when I was uh, in Europe last week, I asked the same question and the word on the street with the Europeans was that a lot of teams hid their talent for the Olympics. This is going to be a big surprise kind of Olympic. Uh, Serbia did not show you anything. They, they brought their third team to the uh, uh, Nations League. Uh, China did not show you anything. Uh, in the Nations League. So we don't know who's good and who's not. Brazil, they think are good. The United States certainly looked good. Uh, but in the women, uh, I think you have to watch each match to find out who's going to come, come forward because people just wanted to save their athletes and the training for one go at this. And they're going to try to peak once not twice, as uh, Todd was talking about. Yeah, the big win for China was the 3-0 over USA women. Yeah. So during the VNL, that was their biggest win. 
yeah, a really lopsided too. Yep. I mean, I would say realist, realistically, just based on general form the last few years, USA, Brazil, China, Italy, and you could probably throw Turkey in there as a team that, that on its day can do some damage. And then after that, it probably drops off. I mean, Serbia, you know, I, Serbia is not what they used to be. They're yeah, I asked somebody solid. about Turkey, and they said Turkey always plays well, but they never challenge. And I said, but their league is great. And they said, yeah, but they never seem to put it together and come with full force. Uh, well, yeah, their league is great, but that's you've got Zhu Ting and you've got Kim Hill. You've got a bunch of really high-paid foreigners playing there. So, yeah. of, course it's, of course, it's pretty good. <laughs> Okay, so we got 12 men's teams and 12 women's teams that were selected for the Olympics. Anyone want to make a prediction? Brian, for women, gold the medal. USA, USA okay. has, has never won. and They've won everything, all the championships except the Olympics all the time. They're the number one team in the world, and this year I don't think they'll get stopped. I think they'll I'll be they'll win the first their first gold medal. I think one of the things that the the, the audience needs to understand, and I would like to get this across to a lot of people, is that in the world, the one women's team sport that was allowed early on was volleyball. And the US was behind, always behind, always trying to catch up. I remember one time when we were 27th in the world when we first started trying to go, and it, it's always been a catch up. And in other sports like softball and basketball and in soccer uh we were we were one of the first countries to start those sports so we were at an advantage so volleyball has always been a disadvantaged sport for women uh, but now we're we've been the best and we will be the best and i really think we're going to win well, i just hope that that both our teams are are in in, a, in the hunt for one of the medals because i think the the best promotion the sport ever gets is every four years when the Olympics comes around, because that's the only time that the sport gets televised, you know, internationally and nationally to the level it does. And, and, and it's, we always seem to get a big boom in the participation of the sport after the Olympics, uh, especially when, when we've been, you know, more competitive and, and been on, on national television. Okay. Mick, you want to add something before I talk a little bit about the our guest next week? Uh, only that uh, when we did the Abilene Clinic, we asked the, the little setter uh, whose mother was there. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we asked her, uh, did she enjoy men's volleyball? And she said, I watch it all the time. I watch the VNL all the time. And I said, who's your favorite player? And it was the uh, Zaitsev from Italy. Uh, and I had a chance to play against his father when he was with the Soviet team. Uh, and he was a setter. His father was a setter, but Zaitsev for Italy is a hitter. And that was her favorite player. I thought that's interesting. We've got a, a young American girl watching volleyball and picks an Italian guy whose dad was a Soviet, big Soviet player uh, as her favorite player. I thought that that's pretty interesting. So we're starting to starting to branch out and watching the game at a high level. Must be well, the hair, Mick. Yeah, the VNL, <laughs> I think the coverage was unbelievable. And so it really opened up and unbelievable. Okay, so let's talk briefly. The guest we have coming on is going to do a pre-recording with us on Monday. And she's been a broadcaster for Japanese network for 38 years. She also was at the 1976 Montreal Olympics when the Japanese won their second gold medal. The first gold medal was in 1964 at the Tokyo Olympics. And she's going to come live on Monday with us while we pre-record and give us an up-to-date on all the things that are happening in Tokyo. And we're so excited about that. I mean, I just... You know, it's our chance to come up with questions. That's right. All of us are coming up with questions today that you're going to email me, correct? Yeah, I thought maybe you were going to tell us that she was going to bring Daimatsu on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I once told that joke and, and one lady from Hattie Mae Wood for, driving a, a Corvette from Orange, Texas, raised her hand in Jim Coleman's clinic and say, who's Dynamite Sue? And I go, 
You mean Diamatsu? Okay, so that's a true story from she came every year to George Williams College. Okay, now you had to be there. You had to be there. Yeah, yeah. You had to be there. Okay, let's hear from our volleyball traveler that was spreading the master coach's teaching philosophy all over Europe. Okay, Mick. And hopefully, he wasn't drinking too much wine when he was doing that. Oh, well, that's all my wife posted. Is every every time we had a glass of wine, she put a picture of. So I'm sure <laughs> so we're double alcoholics here. And uh, uh, but we had a great time. We we actually spent 30 days uh, in Slovenia and uh, uh, Croatia. Uh, we first went into Moribor, flew into Ljubljana, uh, the capital of Slovenia, and then. Uh, uh, then drove down to Moribor, spent some time there at the Draws Center in Moribor uh, as their guests, uh, three courts uh, training uh, the Moribor teams and that sort of thing. And then we drove to Croatia and did a seven day, uh, we sailed down the coast of the Adriatic, uh, down the coast of Croatia in a catamaran. Actually, we had two catamarans and uh, about uh, 14 or 15 of us and I had uh, uh, Russ Carney and, and Sherry Carney w uh, joined my wife and I on one catamaran and Corey Solomon and his family and several other Moribor uh, folks uh, were on the other uh, catamaran and we had a we had a great seven days uh, and I, I wanted to recover a little bit from that and we got back to Moribor and uh, Corey says oh by tomorrow to me you'd be doing triple days you got uh, the practice with the Moribor youth the practice with the uh, the senior team, the under 13 team, and then uh, then your team's coming in, uh, your all-star team with the, of the Americans. So we spent uh, the next two weeks training the Moribor kids. And one of the things they wanted us to do is improve their passing. And we used the passing technique that uh, we've been teaching in the clinics and unbelievable in two weeks, everything changed. And it changed so much that then we could change their offense by running fast because the passes were in the zone all the time. We got in system and all at once the kids, you know, they're at the end of their, their year right now. It was pretty hard to motivate them for a while. Once they saw that they could run fast and they could annihilate the ball. Uh, and, and here's uh, many of the kids from the global challenge. Um, the Moribor kids got really, really good. So good that when they went to the global challenge, the under 18 team one against Hungary, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Austria, uh, all of the teams and the teams from the US, uh, Hawaii, they had one match that went 39-37 uh, in, in one of the matches. Uh, and uh, the Slovenian team from Moribor came back and won that. And that was huge for their, their club. Uh, and then the uh, other team had five kids out with with injuries and they still finished third and my team fortunately got by them in the semifinals so uh, we we beat them in the semifinals um in four and uh were able to play in the finals against it, israel they then won uh the uh, third place match and so both more board teams finished uh first and third and that's the first time that's happened but the play was good logan tom was coaching israel i hadn't really had a chance to sit down with logan and and just uh, talk about how she's doing and her travels and all of that stuff. Uh, she went on a 50 mile bike ride uh, with Corey and Tim Kelly, who is the uh, other sponsor of Bring It Promotions, which put this, this tournament on. And uh, uh, she had a great time. Uh, she's normally not the head coach. She's normally the assistant coach, but uh, the head coach, somebody in the family, I believe, uh, uh, tested positive. And so they couldn't come and Logan took over and she brought back a victory for the Israeli team. But this tournament is, uh, is really fun uh, because we meet so many people from so many different parts of the world. The players really enjoy it because they make lifelong friends. Uh, they're together in the hotel, the testing. We had testing. Um, it was probably as safe as I've ever seen a tournament. And uh, uh, Pula is where, Pula, Croatia is where the tournament was held. We had our own hotel. We took the whole hotel over. We had our own facility. We didn't let spectators in. The only spectators you saw were players from the tournament or their coaches or people with the official delegation. So I think this tournament's back on track. Uh, Corey Solomon, uh, this is a kind of a brainchild 
idea that he's had that he wants to develop and keep developing. He's trying to get uh, raise money to bring in a team from Botswana uh, and a few other places around the world. Uh, it's it's a great development tournament. Uh, clubs can come, um, all star teams can come, and even if you're not under 23, they'll let each team have one older player if, if there's somebody that really wants to come and play. So we had a great time. Uh, my wife and I got to visit uh, a lot of places, including a lot of different wineries. We saw the oldest vine in the world. Uh, that was amazing because I had seen it once before about 10 years ago when I brought my team over there. And this time it was flourishing with grapes. Uh, it was alive and well. Uh, I thought it was dead the first time I saw it, and uh, they they had nourished it back to life, and uh, it was uh, really quite uh, quite fun to walk through the streets and uh, just navigate uh, in these cities uh, in uh, Slovenia and in uh, Croatia. Well, so, Mick, you you, uh, you you taught them uh, you know, the system of of passing that we're using with master coaches. What did you pick up from that was new and different from what they were doing? Well, the, the major th reason that I was able to convince them to do this is because th the ball they use. They use the Mikasa ball that plays differently than the balls we use in the United States. This ball jumps all over the place and, and passing outside your body as we're recommending is a prelude to playing international. Any player that wants to play international has to learn to pass outside their body because of the ball that they play with. This ball does everything, including loops as it comes at you so using that technique you sometimes have to pass high shoulder level you sometimes have to pass at your knee but they were able to grasp it and then all at once uh, i didn't use any buckets incidentally but, but uh, they got the concept uh, without the use of the buckets but uh, they really gravitated to it um, and I, I did a progression just like we do in the clinics and I thought they would be bored with it and they actually got into it and it's learning theory that we've been talking about at our clinics about a lot of people think you can only play six on six to learn anything and that is really not true you have to get your technique right first you have to have your self-confidence you have to be able to know it so well that you know you can do it and then you really get good using it in the six on six play. And that was the major learning theory thing that, uh, that I stressed with the coaches. Their coaches were so open to let me come in and do this. I have to say the, the Moribor coaches were fantastic. Um, and they trusted me that I wouldn't mess up their team. And <laughs> I'm telling you, I was really worried about that because I didn't want to mess up their team. Okay, Mick, we had a question from a viewer. Do they use, in the women's game, use more return of service with their hands or do they use more passing? No, they almost, uh, they almost use an entire uh, passing. Um, there is some overhand, but the crazy ball dies on you so quick that unless you're sure it's gonna stay high, you can get caught with having your hands almost down here to your chest trying to get it up. And, and that just gets your thumbs and a lot of things. We moved the patterns up. We moved the patterns up to 13 to 15 feet and we dared everybody to serve over us. And that did allow us to take some balls overhand. And we did teach that to make sure that we got the hands out and not, not had them close to the head like setting, but got them out away from us had the arms at, at least 90 degree angle. And so we could do that, but uh, okay. that's all the stuff that we do in the clinics, as you okay. know, you guys teach it. Second question, are they doing any top spin serving or mainly jump floaters? No, mainly jump floaters, but, but I'll tell you what, Israel got on top of us with the top spin. The minute we got on top of them, they refused to serve top spin because they didn't want the errors. You know, in men's volleyball, it's not, not uncommon to have 25 to 37 errors uh, serving. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, Israel came out and really hammered us with the top spin with velocity, I would guess 55 to 60 miles an hour. Um, and they got on top of us with that. The second set, I, I tried to encourage our players to get ahead, uh, which they were able to do. We got up on 6-2 and the top spins went away. 
uh, to jump floats and we stayed right in the match and they never can, they tried to come back to it. But once, once you get a team that's a little bit defensive, they don't want to use those top spins as much, uh, mm-hmm. in the women's game, but every team had at least one top spin server, uh, on, on all the, uh, U 23 teams. Okay. Brian, he's chatting with me. Can you believe he chats on this show? All right, Brian, Brian, hey, Brian. No, that wasn't me. She's just hallucinating. <laughs> the, um, Mick, tell us about your last day. The last day. We were worried about how the the last tournament was going to end up. How did you do? Uh, we lost to Israel uh, 20, no, 33-31 uh, in the fourth set. <laughs> um, and uh, we had a chance. We had swings. We had swings to win that fourth set and get it into a fifth game, and we just couldn't do it. But uh, uh, we had one player from Utah, uh, Maddie Robinson, who really brought the heat for us. And uh, she had uh, it was a transfer from BYU that is at Utah now. And I look for her to really show her stuff uh, <clears throat> this coming fall. We also had. Uh, uh, Mamie Girard, who is transferring from uh, San Jose State to Ball State. She'll be a graduate uh, player at Ball State as our setter, who did a wonderful job as our captain. And Sam Steele, who is a, a libero uh, from Nebraska playing at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, did a great job uh, there. Katie Kennedy and uh, Miranda uh, Kinez from uh, Long Beach State, Brian, uh, started for us and did a wonderful job uh, also. And then we had an Eastern Washington kid, uh, Sage Bustard, uh, Bustad, that uh, really came on. She, she just grew through the whole tournament. Uh, we had several other players uh, from uh, Regis, uh, from Canisius, uh, that, uh, oh, and uh, uh, six, uh, six, five, six, six middle played with this uh, Anastasia Rush from Pittsburgh watch out for her next year. She, uh, she is a comer also. So I had a, I had to try to put these kids together in three days and they were willing to let me do that. Uh, some kids didn't quite get equal playing time, uh, but they sure liked being in the championship and that's always important, but they all had a heck of a good time. I've gotten notes from almost every one of them uh, as well, to how much fun the whole, whole thing was. Well, guess what? Our time is up. It's great that you shared the, your knowledge to the to the rest of the people. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I have to tell you, it was a highlight for me, Brian. Yep. Okay, here we go, guys. Our time is up. And thanks for joining us today for Buzz Reaction. We'd like to thank Todd the, for the great interview on Beach and Mick for sharing his recent experiences in Europe. And we didn't have to have any questions for Mick because he just talked the whole time. <laughs> and we are truly looking forward to hearing from our Japanese broadcaster on the current events taking place in Tokyo. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website at www.volleyballmastercoaches.com. Click on the contact form and we look forward to customizing an in-person or virtual clinic for you. Be sure to tell your friends about our weekly news show. Thanks for joining us today. And guess what? We will see you next week on The Buzz. Brian, sing. Yeah, that's right. You got to do no, that. No, that's my chance. I there. missed my cue. That's right. We got to do this. Well, you know what? We got no music. Thing. But guess I, think what? Is, I think this is better closing it this way, Ruth. <laughs> and Brian Gemalero. There well, he goes. Between, between me, me and Brian singing, nobody would ever come back again. <laughs> That's right. Oh, no, well, Italians can sing, Bob. Don't and change that. We are that. retired. Thanks, everybody.